So, uh, so the first question is, how are you coping with the COVID-19 crisis and how do you make sure that you get work done? Well, uh, tips for getting my work done from my uh, perspective, it's been, I mean, part of the problem has been sometimes doing too much work because <laughs> when you, uh, you're in this uh, situation, when that you can, you be, you can in some way you are, uh, you can be enriched by many more people, right? You can be ready for a meeting almost any time, or this. That's what uh, people would uh, would assume by because the distances are shorter now. We assume <laughs> there are no distances. Everybody's at the same distance. So what happens is that if you don't control it, you end up working a lot, and there are no weekends. <laughs> Uh, and this continuous uh, set of meetings. But uh, after, I think that happened to many of us in the, in the first part of the pandemic. And I think, uh, fortunately, at Harvard, we had a lot of support and guidance and, and uh, just awareness of uh, not to stress, be too stressed and not to and, and have a good uh, work-life balance. So I've been able to manage it very well now by uh, well, mixing walks uh, every day with um, uh, then meetings and sitting down at, at home uh, to to just focus on work. I, I also want to say that for when you have a team and or you're running projects, uh, I think the important thing when uh, in, I mean, I don't think it's just the pandemic, but in general, as work becomes more remote and more, uh, and I think we couldn't take advantage of that, right? Because uh, that's a, that could be um, a good, well, trying to figure out what is the right hybrid way of working, half remote, half, half in person, would be, could be ideal for many people. So in that case, it's very important to have uh, very uh, clear understanding of common goals for the projects, what uh, everybody is doing, what we know, what we want to achieve, uh, short iterations on, on uh, milestones that you can review often. Uh, of course, check-ins, um, quick Zoom check-ins once in a while. But there is some work that it's better to be done without meetings. So I think that uh, that's also important. To do in these times, to, there is a strategic work and some review work and more reading and more thinking that you could do, uh, uh, in and uh, well, in, on your own. So taking advantage of those and so that that's been the balance and and we've been able to continue doing a lot of work at Harvard this uh, and uh, well during the whole last year. Thank you. And then question two, before all this, what would a typical working day have looked like and how does it um, look now? Yes, it's, uh, it's easy to forget, right, <laughs> how, it would, how it used to look. Uh, well, I, I used to go a lot of, on campus and to be at my office and it, it would be in general a very friendly environment to talk to everybody around the offices nearby. Most of the team is is the same floor in the offices right next to mine so it was easy to chat with them and I, I guess those are the things that you miss right that just uh, just be able to chat without having planned a meeting and uh, having brainstorming sessions about things that you do like uh, almost spontaneously so yeah it was a lot of a lot of meeting with people a lot of times sometimes walking from one part of campus to another <laughs> To, to meet with uh, different teams and, gr and groups, and, and also a lot more traveling to conferences. <laughs> so I, I think that now it's, uh, well, I'm pretty fortunate right now, and uh, in a beautiful house in the countryside, and can do walks. And that sounds I, much nicer <laughs> than uh, having to travel for conferences all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, well, there's part of traveling for conferences that I also miss, because it's really nice to... Uh, see collaborators, see people that you might work with, and, and uh, just have uh, interesting conversations, and travel sometimes to beautiful places. But uh, but I think it was too much. So I think it has helped me realize that I was way too much. And I like the quiet life, <laughs> and uh, a lot of 
walks in nature and uh, this in be surrounded. Wow. Yeah, no, I understand a beautiful that. Place. <laughs> Sounds <laughs> like a family to Yeah, it. more balanced in a way rather than some unnecessary travel. Now, uh, exactly. Can't, That's can't why we do really, that anymore. <laughs> yes, uh, but hopefully we restore. I mean, that's what we're thinking at Harvard. How we restart after the pandemic uh, by not saying we go back to where we were before. That would be absurd, right? I mean, I think everybody should think about how not how do we go back, but what what have we learned? What we could do better? And is there a better way to uh, provide a, a yeah, a work-life balance, uh, or a productive way, you know, it doesn't need to be less work, but it could be more productive and more enjoyable work. Thanks. That sounds very inspiring. <laughs> so, can you highlight three main ways that your work has supported researchers over the last few months? Okay, um, I yeah, I can think of several things. Some are sort of ongo ongoing, but I'll start with the uh, two or three that, that have happened. So uh, I work, well, one of my roles at Harvard is the, is the university um, research data management officer, university-wide, so working with all schools and collaborating across all the all departments um, and units in the university. And yeah, in that role, uh, I have worked with my colleagues to create a, a service catalog of all, all the services that Harvard provides for this, to support research, uh, mostly focusing on, on data services and computing services, but some also administrative infrastructure services that are also useful to, uh, um, to improve or to enhance uh, how you do your research. So uh, we put together, I mean, the part of the problem uh, is that a lot of the, the support for helping uh, research and, and also focus on, uh, we think of open science or, or, more, or data management or, or just disseminating all the research, uh, all the products or all the artifacts of research, right? Not only the publications, but the, the, the data, the, the code. And so, um, so all those services can be very distributed within a university or, or on a research institution, uh, and and uh, many times you don't know exactly what what is happening right in other units. So doing the inventory of everything that existed and putting it in a common website where it could be shared with a, in a unified way, so that we can compare easily what a uh, what is the uh, well support on research data management or research computing in one area of the university versus another. So that it helps then to, to improve the services later, right? And to see, are there, is there a, an opportunity to unify some of them or to, uh, or to coordinate better some of the services or are, are there some gaps? So that's been one of the areas. Uh, and as part of this, for example, we brought electronic lab notebooks uh, uh, in, in particular our space as, a, as one of the services for uh, researchers at Harvard to to have a, um, to be able to use in the lab to to uh, be able to uh, collect and, and and manage better all the data and, and information that they have connected to a research project uh, and integrate it then with other parts the repositories and other parts of the the well Harvard system so uh, and then others that are maybe are more, a couple more that are more on, ongoing. So with the Dataverse project, we constantly creating new releases that help researchers to continue sharing data yeah, in uh, what we hope to, uh, well, to provide more, more user-friendly ways of sharing data, but also more features that, uh, that facilitates uh, data management and sharing. And, and supporting fair principles. So that's an ongoing thing, right? But in uh, but, uh, particular at Harvard, we've been uh, working on, on a, a proposal. We, this is not yet in place. It hasn't yet uh, helped researchers, but uh, we're hoping that will be the case in the next years. So uh, we're creating a Harvard Data Commons where we integrate the repositories at Harvard, including the Harvard Dataverse, repository for data with the open access uh, repository for publication 
and the, and the preservation repository from the libraries, the Harvard libraries, with research computing. So we and and also supporting better workflows um, and the, the, the containerization of the packaging of, of the of the workflow. To, so so the, the, what you all, all the steps that you've done in your research with the data and the code and so on. So, so that's what we call the, this data commons. And I would say the third one is um, it's been working on areas related to data privacy and, and sensitive data. So in particular, uh, uh, launching a project that is called OpenDB for differential privacy, where uh, we, create, we are building a library of uh, algorithms or methods to add uh, some amount of noise, I mean, uh, an amount of noise to to the statistical releases of a data set, so that you could really release that publicly because it, it protects the the sensitive information of the data sets by uh, by adding uh, sufficient noise that no uh, and no any individual within the data could be re-identified. So I think I said three, yeah. three projects. I, I counted more. four, <laughs> so I have to double check. <laughs> okay. What was the name of that last project? You said open open DP DP from differential DP. privacy. Ah, from... Differential privacy is a mathematical mm. uh, approach to privacy preserving privacy preserving algorithms. Yes. Open the, differential privacy. Yeah. <laughs> open in the sense of open source project. It's an open source project, so uh, yeah. there is a transparency about how we do that, but it adds, it protects privacy. <laughs> if you have any links, then yes. don't hesitate to send them Certainly. to me, so I don't uh, spell it wrong. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. So your career began in research in astrophysics and then the design and implementation of software for astronomical observations. How did you get to where you are today? Yes, that, uh, often I, I just send you the link, by the way, to open the Okay. Uh, so, yeah, uh, uh, I'm often asked <laughs> a similar question. Uh, and at, at first, I usually point out that there are Actually, many uh, large number or large fraction of data scientists are physics, physicists and as astrophysicists, right? Uh, so, because uh, in, in, in astronomy, in astrophysics, and physics, uh, a lot of the the work that uh, that that we do is, well, first of all, managing, analyzing very large amounts of data, uh, and building a lot of the systems that are needed. For, to do so, because the, we don't have usually uh, companies or pro many products that do the analysis of the data, right? Or that, that, that they work on, or they build uh, the, the um, how to uh, do a remote observation in a, in a telescope or so. So they're usually the the systems and the tools that are, that are used in research uh, within astronomy and physics um, happen to be built by the same. <laughs> the same, uh, well, researchers, right, uh, in those fields. So um, you you learn a lot of that by, by actually doing it. So at some point, uh, when there were a, a lot of opportunities to go to um, uh, the private sector and to startups uh, working on software development, uh, just had a, a good opportunity to move into a company, to a startup, and, and then I went into, uh, for a few years, I learned more about software development and manage and led several projects, some on building uh, software for education and some related to biotechs, and which, I mean, in every case, it involves a lot of building uh, yeah, systems that, that would help with data management and analysis, but very focused on on a specific fields, right? uh, and then at some point I was uh, I was missing being at Harvard and uh, in academia, and uh, I went back to Harvard. But in that in that case, with a role of uh, creating a project that ended up ended up being the DataVerse for um, well a platform for creating uh, 
and data sharing platform, right? And building a repository for making data more accessible for research. And that was a much more general, a generalizable approach than it had, what I had done before, but it's got a lot of the common, uh, yeah, common areas. So, so it's, it's a, um, from the from now it looks like it could have been planned, but also in life there are a lot of things that are just happen at the moment that personal sometimes so, yeah. personal the parts of life your, is yeah. yeah that gives you opportunities that are part personal situations that make you think okay maybe now it's a good moment to make a change and so but from once you've gone through it you could make sense of it. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Those choices we make along the way, yes. they make sense and they make a difference. So it definitely sounds like, yeah, sharing, data sharing was something you wanted to get behind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. And now we have a, a lighter question. <laughs> this was uh, one of Ron's inputs. <laughs> FC Barcelona or do you have any favorite football players? <laughs> Well, it's very easy answer. <laughs> I'm from Barcelona, so Barca always. <laughs> uh, and I guess Messi, because we all love Messi. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, I don't watch it that often. It's only when there is a, like a, a, a very interesting match. Could be yeah. Barca Madrid or some finals or so. So, but I did. I, I for many years I've been playing soccer uh, in 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 Boston with a women's team. Oh wow! So <laughs> you're actually yeah, you actually know a lot I, about I football. <laughs> doesn't mean that I know. It's a very friendly <laughs> team. Uh, well. Uh, right. We got together and we said, oh, why don't we? We used to coach our our sons or our daughters and. And at some point we said, why don't we learn more about it and play ourselves? And we made a team and now we're in the, some, uh, yeah, some tournaments in, in New England. <laughs> oh, that's great. Do you still, well, before Corona, were you playing or? I was playing just before, yeah, mm. that, that uh, I think, but I haven't been playing since then, unfortunately. But I'm, Oh, I'm is sure this something that. you can pick up again, maybe? Yeah, getting older, but yeah, I'll try to. <laughs> Yeah, we have I was to stay never good at so uh, there's no there is not much to you know. I I, know, I don't claim to be good. It was a lot of fun though. Yeah, it's about having fun and getting exercise, isn't it? And it's social. It's also exactly. very social. So yeah, it was wonderful. The the women's team. Yeah, it was very okay, nice. Okay, well, I'm sure we will get an opportunity to continue that or to meet them again and have a have a have a rematch. <laughs> Yes. A post-COVID match. Um, actually, women's football is quite big in Norway. We don't need to go into that now. But uh, oh. yeah, it's uh, it's on national TV. And, yeah, yeah, I've seen it. It's it's yeah, it seems to be quite big here. So that's great. Yeah, good, good for Norway. Norway <laughs> does a lot of things very well. So that's another one. <laughs> and yeah, back to a more technical question. Um, Dataverse is used more and more. But what are its major features and major current developments, including DDI, CDI, metadata standard? And then a sub-question, who are your main users and are there differences between US and European users? Okay. Uh, let me see. There is um, a lot into the questions. <laughs> is it where I start? So, uh, yeah, um, they, they were having growing. Uh, I mean, the most important part of, part of the universe that has, the universe project that has grown is the community. It's community, right? And and by uh, of developers and, and users, uh, and also not only growing in size, but also being much more engaged. So in some in some way, um, a lot of the new features now also come from groups, not only in the Institute for Quantitative Social Science at Harvard, where it was first developed and it continues being developed, but also from groups all over the world, right? And, and Europe has, uh, many groups in Europe has had a very strong, um, well, contribution to, 
to the project and to new features. So there are some of the features that are being developed now in, and in Paris, thanks to the to some members of the community. Uh, for example, more better support for multiple licenses, so that provide more licenses. Uh, so the universe had. Um, but you also ask about the main features, right? So some of the main features, I would say, are uh, providing workflow um, um, for for depositing data, uh, being able to publish it with a DOI, a data site DOI, or, 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 or it could be handled on it, but, uh, but it is most of the time a, a DOI persistent identifier, right? And a data citation that gives credit to the data offers uh, and so on. Um, and it supports a data set, um, well, first data, dataverse collections, so a collection of data sets and data sets with metadata and files. Right. And, and, and recently, we've been adding features that, that uh, uh, adds more support for different uh, well, ways of depositing uh, very large amounts of files uh, and every time depositing more data. It supports any type of file, so in that way, we think of the platform as a generalist data repository because it can support many, many fields, but it was initiated well, it started with uh, support for social science. Uh, and because of that, it has a, a very strong support for DDI, right? And so it's, it's I mean, data was taken from the beginning, metadata as a very important part of uh, stand, metadata standards, an important part, part of the features. So uh, we, we try to export to all the standards that are useful to the community, right? And uh, so the metadata can be can be for the Dublin Core in data site metadata and DDI. But uh, one of the things that uh, I think distinguishes from other repositories is also the extensive variable metadata for tabular data files that the DDI supports very well. So all the detailed uh, uh, variable uh, well, uh, the file level of the, the variable labels and names and, and type, variable types. And so, and that uh, helps a lot to then be able to explore the data, to do analysis on the data and to standardize it. And, and hopefully at some point be able to merge one data file with another, right? So that's when DDI, CDI that you also ask, uh, ask about, uh, uh, well, comes, comes in because uh, uh, Dataverse is very well place to, to extend now and be able to support the DDI CDI. So we've been identifying a few use cases that could be useful to uh, to support. And we're working um, yeah, with uh, with Simon Hudson from CoData with Stephen uh, um, Macker. I want to say the name right because I don't pronounce it very well. Uh, from also the from the Australia, uh, from, uh, sorry. <laughs> from, the Australian, what is it? A Australian uh, data. ADA. The, yeah. Data, yes. <laughs> ADA. ADA, um, that's it. <laughs> yes. Austri um, Australian data archive. Yeah, I think I get their exactly. newsletter. That's exactly. about as much as I know about them. <laughs> yeah, no, they're wonderful. They use the Dataverse and they've been expanding also while well, helping to expand and be very creative with the functionality. So uh, we, we're working and, uh, uh, with several others. And I, got, I should give, I should mention all the names now, but uh, I'll, I can give them to you <laughs> later. But uh, uh, yeah, just to see how we would it, um, support the ICDI dataverse. So I, I believe you ask a few another connected question, right? Um, uh, yeah, sorry, it was a combination of two questions. <laughs> so that was the first one. And then the second question was, who are your main users? And are there differences between European yes. and US mm -hmm. users? Yes. So uh, yeah, in terms of users it just depends on what where you, um, what you refer to so for the Harvard data repository which is open to to any researcher uh, and for any discipline uh, so we have users from any researcher individual researcher we also have journals that use the uh, the repository to to just well uh, 
able to deposit all the data that accompanies the publications in the in the journal, right? Um, and, and yeah, it doesn't have to be associated or related with hardware. The hardware database is open to other research community. Uh, but then the, the Dataverse software platform, right, that are the open source platform, uh, in that case, the users are usually in uh, re research institutions, research organizations, universities all over the world that either they have, they want to set up their own um, institutional repository or repository for uh, very often in the case that it's a repository to support uh, several universities, for example, in Norway, right? Uh, that there are several universities that would use Dataverse under, under the same platform or the same instance or installation of the Dataverse software. Uh, and, but but uh, several, uh, but the, each one has its own collection. The same in in, in Texas, there is a, a consortium of universities, so they use all the same installation. In Canada, there is something similar, right? And then data archives, like like we just mentioned, for the Australian data archive, uh, they would be another user. But it are users and contributors and developers, so they become everything in this case. Uh, yep. And I think the differences between European uh, US, I don't, I don't think there is necessarily that huge differences. I think that the what have we seen though that Europe has been uh, has advanced more or has been more proactive and supporting open science. Um, and uh, so with the EOS, right, the European Open um, Open Science Cloud, and with other uh, well. I'm sure says that has also uh, played a role with many organizations that have been supporting that. So, so that they're they're uh, ready to to just well uh, provide solutions for sharing data. In, in the U.S., there are some universities that are moving forward very much with that, and, but it hasn't reached everywhere yet. Thanks. So what are the main barriers for the reuse of research data and code? Uh, what is for you the key to improving research data management? Yeah, the main barriers, uh, and we, we keep finding new ones, but, uh, but uh, I'll mention a couple. Right? Uh, uh, one is the fact that when we have well, when our own researchers, I'm also from the perspective of research and the perspective of a data professional data that, that it supports uh, researchers, right? So I can see from, from um, uh, create or, or, or prepare your data in a way that anybody else, right, that besides you and your group can use it, right? So uh, provide the, the the proper descriptions and metadata that are being uh, organized and clean with uh, formats that are uh, easy to reuse and so so uh, I, I think that the lack of, of this uh, description of the data uh, and the, the inform I mean if you, if you just put a, a table of values that means nothing right when you start having a, a something that describes every column. I mean, now we're talking about tablet of data, of course, it could be other types of data, it's not tablet. of data. When you start describing every column, you have more information, but when you describe how that that variable uh, attribute was collected and how it compares to others, and does it use a control book or you know, is it, does it follow a standard, and how you can, then you, you can start understanding better the data set, right? So the more you describe it and the more standardized it is, the easier it is to reuse. And I think that's one of the problems and that's one of the areas that data curators and, and research data management can help to just do that from the beginning instead of doing it at the end when you have to publish the data and then <laughs> you don't have all that information, right? And even if you don't do it to for somebody else to reuse it, we often say that even for your own research, if you go back to it after five years to understand how that data set was collected, what it was, what were the transformations of the data, and so, so well, you 
very familiar with building a code book for it, right? So some, some things like uh, similar things, but that expand. So my be different discipline how you think about it. So that's one thing. The other thing I think is that the issue that some data that uh, well, growing number of data in social science, but uh, also in other definitely medicine and health and, uh, and public health. And so there is um, data that has privacy issues. Like we talked before about sensitive data sets um, or data that comes from industry right, or from technologies that, that they have a hard time sharing it for research. So having both the proper data use agreements to be able to use data more easily for um, to be uh, be able to be used for research, but also having the the, the infrastructure, uh, the technology, and the, and all the tools to be able to analyze data that has privacy uh, information, right? Um, and that that's. I mean, they're, we're working on that, and there, are, there start to be solutions, and it can be well done, but it's still is not very. So those are the main two barriers, I would think. But I'm sure there are more. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So on the one hand, a lack of yeah description of data and all the necessary standards and metadata and formats, etc. But then also you highlighted yeah privacy issues and having the right kind of use agreements and tools in a way for this interoperability, but that is reliable and safe. And yeah, so yeah, thank you. And then, oh yeah, so the key, that was the other part of the question, the key to improving research data management. And I guess it's two keys. <laughs> I guess it's well, better data management. Well, there is never just one thing. It's never just it's one, it's kind of both. <laughs> Well, and, and probably some of things, but I think I, that uh, part, of, part of it is uh, to for both of those things uh, being well, have the, the more uh, education, the something people talk about the cultural change or the or the, the the awareness of that these things can be started at the beginning. You could think about about, about that. Plus, providing the right infrastructure and tools. To help. Whenever this can be done over meter or easy, easy, it should be done, right? But there are sometimes there are legal issues too, and so so I think that I don't know. Would say describe it as a one key. I, I think it's that bringing all those different groups together. That it's not research is not anymore about the, just one researcher that goes and collects the data and wants to analyze, right? It's about having uh, um, a, a data clean, well, somebody that is more a data professional, data scientist, or, the, or data, uh, somebody that understands about data management, somebody who knows data curation, there's sometimes a legal aspect. So there's all those things, collaborating on all those things and understanding all of them from the beginning helps to them that they have the better quality and more reusable. Thank you. So Harvard University has a reference guide on research data management, but are you familiar with the CESDA data management expert guide? And is there room for collaboration? Always oh, room for collaboration, <laughs> definitely. Uh, I am not familiar, very familiar with it, so I, sh I don't want to say something. I know that it is a, uh, probably read many parts of it, but uh, uh, I think uh, I would need, <laughs> yeah, I uh, like to be careful about <laughs> how much I, uh, I, I love to learn more about it to see in more ways we could collaborate. Great. Well, I can definitely, I can like highlight, I can send you a couple of videos and point you because it's quite a, it's quite a complete guide. In fact, interestingly, the training section of the website and our data management expert guide are our most popular web pages and they have been for like the last two years. So oh, we've, we've, yeah, we've really found that this seems to be filling a need because when you look for what people, I've done a little bit of research on the web to say, okay, what are people looking for? And when they mm -hmm. look up data management or research data management, then they're basically looking for what is it? How do I do it? 
And then our data management expert guide like really answers that. Like we have seven chapters, so we go through the whole research data lifecycle. Uh, yeah, the, the whole life That's cycle. Great. And it's That's great. Yeah, yeah, we now I'll have love, like a I'll campaign love to get it become more familiar. Yeah, anymore. I can send you. I can. To, I'll send you a couple of links. And we've had like for the last two years now, we've had an ongoing Twitter campaign called Data Management Monday. And each each Monday, so I've already scheduled it for next Monday now. Each Monday, we basically uh, pick one aspect of the data management guide and we go through all the chapters so that we cover them equally. But we pick like one thing and either make a poll out of it or a question. And then on Monday, we share that. Um, okay. Yeah, and we found that to be quite successful. There's quite a lot of engagement around That's data great. management. That's great. That's a very good idea. So, so yes, uh, uh, yeah, it, think, it would be fantastic mm, to collaborate and find a way that, especially yeah, with training materials and things like that, that could be shared. Mm. Okay, yeah, that would be that's a great idea. Great, I'll but, pop you yes. a link. Actually. We have a group that uh, well, it's the research data coordination group, the research data management coordination group, and. And he, he, there are um, data professionals, data, data curators, data research data managers for across all the schools at Harvard. Hmm. Uh, and, and maybe it would be good if one of the times you uh, you join us and it's a working group that uh, that we uh, help us connect and see what's happening across the different schools. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> Well, I would say the 11, I would never be president of the U.S. Not, <laughs> I, for one thing, I can't. You have to be born in the U.S. <laughs> and, uh, I was born in Barcelona, <laughs> so that will not uh, work for me. <laughs> uh, I know it's a, a hypothetical question, but I don't know. Uh, so what are you most looking forward to achieving in 2021? Yeah, I think that's a nice question. What are you most looking forward to achieving in 2021? Uh, Let's end on a hopeful it, note. <laughs> I know, it's a very difficult one. Uh, uh, let's see, because I have a number of projects that I want to be successful. <laughs> I hope that they are successful, but since you're asking me to choose one thing, um, uh, I, I, I think achieving that we move some step forward towards uh, well, continue the, to, towards supporting open science. So it first starting at Harvard, so that uh, uh, there is more awareness and and more um, uh, all the way from infrastructure to tools to services to um, to any to policies and so to support that. Uh, but then beyond Harvard for. Uh, or in any place in the world to be able to support more uh, data sharing, co-sharing, reproducibility, and rigor in research, better quality to, to provide better quality research. And so, but uh, I, I think I think at the end, it's important is also that all the research that we do has a, a good application to improve society and to improve uh, the world we live in uh, and, and to improve our knowledge of, of the world that surrounds us. So just having this combination of uh, achieving that people trust more in science and trust, and that they, that they also, I mean, while well, needs to be verified, um, so but that there is a more di a more dialogue with uh, researchers, scientists, um, society, so that it's more understood uh, why it's important to. Uh, to learn about the world around us. Thank you. I was going to say it could also be a, it could also be something private that you're looking forward to achieving. Like it could be, a, it could be, uh, a, I don't know, writing a book or playing the piano oh, or. <laughs> well, so yeah, I've been trying all of them during the pandemic. <laughs> One of the things that I'm, I'm I started uh, some time ago, but it's going to be a decade or two of work is uh, writing up a uh, play or might end up being a Netflix series and you know, <laughs> also similar type of series about the cosmic microwave background and, uh, and, and combined with a, a, a human love story. So <laughs> just 
Uh, yeah, so I have a, a, an idea of a plot and I've been developing and I've interviewed Just, oh, many, okay. several phys- cosmologists to, to get a lot of the input on the, uh, on how the cosmic microwave background was discovered that I used to sh- to have an office just next to one of the Nobel Prize, uh, Robert Wilson, one of the Nobel Prize. So Wilson and Pence just discovered the microwave background. Uh, Wilson was uh, at Harvard for a while, but it still goes at the Center for Astrophysics. So that inspired me to write about that. Um, I was just going to ask him for... and a few other people. <laughs> For for non physicists, what is a cosmic microwave? <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. Uh, yeah, I was told that I shouldn't call it the cosmic microwave, but now nobody will read. <laughs> will, will look at it. I'm imagining a microwave so, in Futurama. So I, I have like a Futurama seed in my head, so that can't be right. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I need to find the right the right title that, that attracts people without <laughs> scaring them. Uh, but, so is a, is a radiation that, that was released at, very soon after the Big Bang? Uh, the Big Bang, you probably know because it's been <laughs> good. Uh, there's a lot more um, yeah, uh, explanations about the Big Bang. So um, the, the, it's a radiation that, uh, that has been expanding while the universe is, uh, is expanding, right? And, uh, and as of now, is at 2.7 Kelvin, so about three degrees, absolute degrees, right? Kelvin degrees. Um, and, and it's all, all around the, um, the universe. So no matter what you observe, or whatever direction, you'll find this microwave. It's microwave, it's very, this low temperature radiation that is, are, are just the leftover of uh, the Big Bang. So, uh, so it's a very, I find it very romantic surrounding uh, Thank you. radiation. Well, I look, for, I look forward to that play. Time. So look, we're already in <laughs> the month 20 of May. Years. <laughs> I was going to say, you need to get writing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's going to take a while. But, but uh, yeah, so you're right. One of the achievements with finding more time to write and do some of these personal things are so yeah exactly fine. i was having these personal goals as well and maybe now yes. is a really good time to realize that these personal goals are really important and they're not going to get done if we keep prioritizing work <laughs> right or we we look too high about trying to change the world maybe we change little parts little by little. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah great so, thank you yeah, very much well, thank you for all the questions well, you're welcome. So I've got. It's a I've very nice conversation. So. Aww. <laughs>